So a lot of time, effort, and attention goes into crafting an entire season. Not just which pieces are we going to play and how do they go to it with each other in a particular program, but what's the arc like for the entire season? And when you look under the microscope, sometimes you find connections that you didn't consciously realize at the time. There's a lot of serendipity happening. Because in fact, this upcoming concert, our night in Prague, continues many of the themes that we first established in our previous Masterworks concert. Now, if you recall, in our previous concert, it, we included the Mozart's fourth uh, horn concerto. Well, that was written in the exact same year as Mozart's Symphony No. 38, his Prague Symphony, which we're performing on this concert. Similarly, uh, Be uh, Beethoven's sixth symphony, his Pastorelle, has also been used as the model for Dvorak's eighth symphony in that both use birdsong. For example, Dvorak's opening theme of his eighth symphony, was nothing more than quoting uh, one of the birds that he, would, uh, that he grew up listening to, much like Beethoven did when he used the cuckoo in his sixth symphony. So with that in mind, uh, this particular concert has a much more um, obvious theme, a night in Prague. So Mozart was incredibly popular in Prague, as opposed to Vienna, where audience tastes could be much more fickle. On one day, you're the toast of the town. On the other day, you're a nobody. But it was Prague who was consistently a supporter of Mozart's music. Mozart was enjoying the success of his opera, The Marriage of Figaro, and he was literally a rock star. Think of Hamilton today. I mean, it's all the rage, and that's what the, Mozart, that's what the Marriage of Figaro was for Mozart. And riding on this wave of success, audiences wanted to hear a symphony from him, and so he wrote what is now known today as the Prague Symphony. And here he was pushing the envelopes of symphonic composition. Unusually, there are only three movements. Uh, at Mozart's time, you would usually have a fast movement, a slow movement, a minuet, and another fast movement. Here, because the first movement is so expansive and, and uh, uses so many uh, revolutionary techniques, uh, Mozart dispensed with the minuet just because the gravitas, the, the, the symphony did not need the gravitas or the extra length. One thing that was happening at this time was Mozart, for the first time, was really considering the woodwinds as individual instruments. This is the beginning of what we know as modern orchestration. Until this time, a lot of composers would usually just double the oboe or the flute or even the clarinet with what the violins were doing. Rarely would, would a composer actually use, let's say, the flute or the bassoon in solo passages, let alone the entire wind section by itself for its own coloristic advantages without the aid of the string section. So here, all of a sudden, Mozart is expanding his coloristic palette. And of course, because he was Prague's favorite son, the symphony was a smashing success. An interesting pairing on this program is the music of Janáček and the music of Dvorak. The entire program begins with Janáček because he began his compositional career where Dvorak left off. His early music is very conservative and very romantic, Janáček's that is, and by the time he ends his career in the early or mid 20th century, Janáček was uh, questioning and uh, challenging our notions of rhythm and harmony and structure. Began, we begin with uh, these Moravian dances by Janáček because folk music is the primordial DNA of all Czech music, especially that of Dvorak. When we play these Moravian folk dances, this is exactly the kind of music that Dvorak would have grown up with that informed his ear. So when Dvorak would write his symphonies and his, his melodies, they were either direct quotes of these types of folk, folk songs or were so imbued in the style that they are virtually indistinguishable from them. And so I thought in our night in Prague, I thought it would be a good idea to sort of establish what does a Czech folk song sound like, a folk melody or folk dance. And these settings by Janáček are absolutely masterful. When we get to the music of Dvorak, his eighth symphony, Dvorak had already uh, a great taste of success. He was known as a symphonist by this time and he was celebrated by critics like Hanslich and uh, other composers, most prominently Johans, uh, Johannes Brahms. Dvorak had enjoyed quite a bit of success by the time he wrote his Eighth Symphony. Um, in fact, we know today that he's written a total of nine, and in fact he thought of his first four or five symphonies as works of juvenilia that he really didn't want published. It was only after his death that somebody wanted to make some money and actually published his his original uh, five, or earliest five symphonies. So that is why if you find recordings from all oh, the 50s and 60s, 
Uh, you see that the New World Symphony is sometimes called Symphony No. 5, while today it is now called Symphony No. 9. That is because in this time, publishers decided to publish the, the earlier symphonies of Dvorak that he himself uh, refused to have published. But when we come to the Eighth Symphony, it is the sunniest of them all. On the heels of the Seventh Symphony, which is very dark and brooding, uh, this one is very light and optimistic, which is why it's often been compared with Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, the Pastorelle. Not only do they use uh, birdsong and the like, but they evoke qualities of, um, of gratitude and joy. So there, no, there's a great story about Dvorak VIII. In the last movement, it begins with a trumpet fanfare. And there is this great moment when the famous conductor Raphael Kubelik was in rehearsal. And he was rehearsing the trumpets who were probably playing it too loud. And he said, gentlemen, trumpets in Bohemia never call to battle. They always call to dance. 